right. The following week's program, AEW on August 11th, they're back to their old tricks again. The opening match. The Hardly Boys and Kenny Olivier against Dante Martin and the Seidel brothers. And again, they're on first. And again, I thought at least this will make watching this program easier because the first 30 minutes of this will go quickly. Uh, and on speed search, it, it, on speed search, the bucks look normal because that's the way they move all the time. Like, you know, a speeded up video. Uh, but at least I didn't have to sit and hear the announcing. But you know the Super Bowl. Brian, they play it, what, at the end of January every year. It's in all the papers. They put it on TV. You've seen it before, right? I have indeed, yes. Okay, and you know that to counter-program the big TV event of the Super Bowl, you know what they have on the Animal Planet? The Puppy Bowl. The Puppy Bowl where they get a bunch of cute, adorable, little soft, furry puppies and put them on what looks like a miniature football field and let them romp and scamper around and roll over at each other and play with toys. I've figured out that that's what the matches that the Hardly Boys, the Cucamonga Kids, Balding Buck and his brother Pieface, that's what they look like. They look like the puppies playing the puppy bowl. Interesting. You know what they do in Jacksonville? When the Super Bowl is being played? I do not. Nothing. <laughs> Very good. Um, it's like they're, they're, they're cute, fuzzy little things that are not intimidating, and they just roll around and romp, and it's like a, a, a spoof of the actual athletic event. That's what the Hardly Boys' matches are. It's a spoof of an actual professional wrestling event. Yeah, that's their they, whole thing. They've got the pubes glued back on their faces again, like, you know, Cartman got gypped by Scott Tennerman. Um, and, and then finally, Dante Martin, who at least they have tried to push in the past. Matt Seidel's a veteran, but they beat him like a drum and his, his brother. They, you know, Dante Martin has some upside, so they single him out and they hit him with everything they've got. And somehow I think they probably sold him on, well, this will make you really strong because it takes us all these moves to beat you. Well, of course, that's counterproductive to them being top guys. It should only take them one move to beat this guy. But secondly, with hitting them, with hitting him with every move in the fucking book, just beat him flatter than a goddamn rug. Just flatter than a fucking rug. Twinkle Toes hit him with something, then he pulled him up, hit the one-winged fairy on him. Then they pulled him up again and put him on his knees, and all three of them hit that shitty-looking fucking knee lift while holding his hands while the guy was on his knees and couldn't take a bump. Who told them? What wrestling veteran said to the Hardly Boys, that little shitty knee thing you do looks really good for a finish. Do more of it. Who said that? None of them, because if they did, they probably would stop doing it because they don't listen to the veterans. Anyway, so it was 20 minutes in before this thing was over. Oh, wait, they're doing an in-ring promo. Don Fallis got started, but then Christian Cage's music interrupted. And Christian comes out, but Fallis tells him, rightfully so, that he's outnumbered. There's like seven of them in the ring and one of him. So guess who comes out? Jungle Boy and Dino Douche. And now there's three baby faces and seven heels and the baby faces are going to the ring and we go to a break. They now have breaks in the promos. What did they do for three and a half minutes standing there in front of the live crowd twiddling their dicks in their hands? So they come back and they're in the ring. As I said, baby faces out number two to one. Fallis is still talking. He does. I've always liked Don Callis's promos in 97 when he was the Jackal. He's well-spoken and he's got conviction, but he could do a good job here if he had any serious talent to manage and to work with, and if he had any material. But he's hamstrung by this clown show. They won't be serious. They make him make jokes. They make jokes to him. Everybody's playing it broadly. They're mugging for the camera, pulling faces, as William Regal would say. 
And this whole promo was almost all smart mark material. They talked about five-star match that you've been wanting to have, Christian. Boy, you got one of the greatest finishing moves ever. Kenny can't wait to kick out of your finish. And then fucking... You carny Christian, piece of shit or whatever I, I was about to say, Christian calls Phallus a carny piece of shit because you can tell... Um, the Young Bucks have been isolated from the actual real wrestling world for so long. They've read on the internet what it was like and what people were in it. And so they think, because they've listened to other marks say that, because they were never in real locker rooms and they wouldn't have been accepted in them. So they think that carny piece of shit is like an ultimate insult somehow. And that everybody is, that lies in wrestling is a carny piece of shit. The Carnies were actually much more successful than these fucking idiots it, because you didn't know that the Carnies were trying to bullshit you because they were good and smooth. But these people, the Bucks, Phallus, who the, uh, Olivier especially, you wouldn't believe a word they said because they're not convincing. So they're shitty Carnies. Anyway, Cage finally spoke. He's going to face Harpo, old Harpo fingerfuck, for the... AEW title at all out on the for the pay-per-view for the title but he's also going to face Harpo on Friday night's Rampage on free TV for the Impact title so they're going to give away and I didn't know what was going to happen at this point but they're going to give away the the title match at the pay-per-view on free television let's see how this works out then they start playing the music and everybody's reacting. And then suddenly Jungle Boy says, wait, stop. I think he forgot he was supposed to say something. Because, you know, he's so scared of doing promos. He's so scared. He runs. This is what he said. He runs and hides when they ask him to do promos because it's not his thing. Never has a guy had more charisma and more potential and done more by himself to sabotage all of that than Jungle Boy. He can't get out of his own way. So if he speaks, started the promo over again to say something about the next week, the tag match, it's going to, for the title, it's going to be him and Dino Douche against the Hardly Boys. So he got that in. And then they start the music again, and then Twinkle Toes says, wait, stop the music. Because they were singing Tarzan Boy. Oh, are you saying oh or no? <laughs> and the people said, oh, we're saying, fuck you. And then they started the music. We're 30 minutes into this two hour program. And these motherfuckers are the only thing we've seen. So comment on that before we move forward. A few things. One, very impressed with Dante Martin. Unfortunately, I think it was counterproductive with him being pinned in the end after getting beat up by all of them. And I understand, I agree with what you said, how they probably would have sold it to him. Although at this stage of his career, probably don't have to sell it to him. Just tell him what to do. No, they were just, they were just giving, they were teaching him incorrect information. They were teaching him what they wanted him to learn to benefit them rather than teaching him what he should know to benefit himself, which is if they're going to beat him at all, they should hit him with a finish and beat him. Boom. One, two, three, instead of pulling him up and hitting him with 17 more things and just beating a dead rug. He is so impressive, and he stands out in a promotion filled with guys who do high-flying stuff that I would not have beaten him here. And I, I know that's why they put him in the match, was to profile him, but, man, I would not have beaten him. He, he, got, <laughs> exactly. the crowd, he got the crowd into it. He looked so impressive in there. So I'll say that. The other thing I'll say, and you and I so, will... Is, so either Seidel could have flipped a coin and, and everybody would have been fine because the, they're at where they are going to be. But this kid has an upside, so they yeah. just beat him just down into power. And I don't want some red velvet shit where a year later he comes and he's like, you beat me a year <laughs> ago, but I was just starting out and now I'm ready. Like no, We can't do that again. I will say, and you and I will probably disagree on this, and we'll talk more about it when we get to Rampage, out of this whole act with the elite, and it is one of the lamest things in wrestling history, the bad comedy, the basketball crap, having multiple flunkies who were just comedy figures like Nakazawa and Cutlet, 
Nick Jackson is talented. I'll I'll say that. Matt Jackson is one of the most worthless wrestlers in the history of wrestling. He's not very good in the ring. His promos are terrible. Awful personality, and he seems to want to be Dick the Bruiser in there. But with that said, I think all of them are holding Omega back. And, and what I mean is, I think Omega isn't the weak part of this whole thing. I think Omega, to the best of his ability, and there's still stupid shit, and we'll talk about that in the Christian match, I think Omega's doing as good as he can to be a serious heel. I don't see him as a main wait, event wait, world wait. champion I was, heel. I was about to agree with you if you'd have put a period after can. I believe he is doing as good as he can, but you think he's actually trying to be a serious champion? I think, I don't know about serious, but I think this is as okay. good as he can do at being a serious wrestling character. Okay, I'm back with you then. This is as good as he can do, but he's not trying to be serious. As good as he can do, I've always said it, I don't see him as a main event uh, champion, I see him as more of an intercontinental, and I know there are other people who point, oh, look at what he did in the Tokyo Dome, look at this, look at that, I get it. I don't see him at that level. When I see him in the ring, and he's a smaller guy, and he's got these belts, and he's got all these comedy performers with him, he doesn't seem like a serious champion, he seems like a goof. I don't think, though, he's the weak part. I think the Young Bucks are really, really well, I, I will go home heat you. right now. I don't think Omega's the problem. I think Callis kind of sucks. I know I'm one of the rare people that thinks that. Uh, I'm not even talking about him on a personal level. I just, I've never thought yeah, he could talk, but I never thought his promos really were effective. I hated him in ECW. I wasn't a big fan of him in WWE, but that's any, not I, that's not I, his I, fault because the I Truth never Commission saw an ECW. I had my frame of reference was the Jackal, but I, I don't need ECWs. I would like Omega a lot more if there wasn't so much bad comedy around him. I could deal with all of his fucking pointing and dancing and everything if it wasn't man. surrounded by all this other shit. You're a charitable man. Yeah, I've been told. Um, Malachi Black on this episode was a horror movie host with dramatic material and still has Cody's boot. And immediately after that, they played footage from Cody's new reality show that to make it obvious that that's what he put Malachi Black over to take time off for, to promote. And Tony Schiavone tried to slip in. Well, they've been shooting this. I hope he'll be able to shoot some more. Yeah, I think he'll be all right. He did have one good line when he held up the boot. He says, you have one foot in the grave. I thought that was good. <laughs> uh, okay, well, now we know uh, who the three nondescript white guys were on the previous week's program because Daniel Garcia in a single match with 2.0, and you're right, they were Ever Rise. Yeah. Uh, took on Darby Allen with Sting, and I wrote, can somebody feed all these guys a fucking sandwich? Darby Allen's 150. Garcia's painfully thin. 2.0 looked good because uh, looked good looked big because they're standing next to the other two. And then there's Sting, a grown adult man, six feet two and 240 or whatever. 212. He's probably lightened up. 230 now. Um, and he's the one in the corner. But and this match went through a break. The combined weight of both of these guys. Wrestling on a national television program could not have been over 300 pounds. Not by much. And then when Darby wins, as we knew he was going to, then there's an afterbirth where Darby continues to beat up Skinny McGee, and then Sting beats up both of the job guys in Skinny McGee's corner. And it took a while. And it took a while. And Stinger... The backhands worked when you were over like God and it was the middle of a match with flair, but are those backhands the worst strikes you've ever seen from a main event wrestler? It's uh, just... Well, yeah, I mean, do you consider Shane McMahon a main event wrestler? No, I don't. Okay. All right, this was an easy show to watch, though, uh, because up next was Hatchet Head Taylor, My Little Dog Pockets, and the part of Trent will now be played by Wheeler Utah. Or Wheeler useless, because as soon as Trent comes back, what's he going to be doing? Are they not going to be best friends anymore? And Chris Flatlander was in the corner, and this was another six-man tag. Wait a minute. Did we have the six? The last six-man tag was on the previous show, or I forget. No, that was on this show. That was the one with the Bucks and Omega. Yeah, six-man tag. The second two matches earlier. Tag of the show, yeah. Two matches earlier. Um against private party and Matt Hardy. And so anything that the best friends are involved in can be easily skipped. Uh, but at the end, somehow Jack Evans had appeared and they beat 
Trent stand in and the bunny and the baker were out there too. And this was 15 minutes on national television. No wonder they were back under a million with this show. Uh, Andre Oli Oli O came out with Chavo Guerrero and Chavo did most of the talking and all of the intelligible speaking. But I ask you a question, Brian last you've got friends all over the world. Can the people who speak Spanish understand Andrade, or is he like a boomhauser in 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 Spanish as well? Nobody is he like just marble mouth that nobody in any language can understand, or is it just the problem he has with English? I'll find out. I'll do a case study this next coming week. Yes, let's because I did the, notice this week they stopped doing the uh, um, the subtitles. The subtitles when he did his promos, and I was paying attention very closely to see how much I could understand. So that's the question we want to know, folks. If you're out there, if you're a Spanish speaker, can anybody in any language understand what this guy fucking says? Um, another package with Santana and Ortiz challenging FTR, VTR, the arm injury. Um, again, look at the collection of outlaw mud show indie clowns that gets paraded into this ring live on a regular basis, but yet two of the only serious tag teams, one of which happens to be the best tag team in the goddamn world. We're getting a fucking 60 second pre-tape package. But they had to have time for the next match, which was Nyla Rose with Vicky Guerrero against Chris Flatlander with my little dog Pockets. Was this three times for Pockets on this program? Uh, at least two, but I think there may have been another one. I think two I so think far. There's another one out there somewhere. But anyway, yeah. So what? The, really? So at this point, I started to get pissed. They're not even trying. Uh, I'm speed searching through this. At but at one point, Pockets was selling. Vicky Guerrero at ringside screaming at him. She just walks up and starts screaming and he covers his ears and bends over and stands there and lets her scream at him. While Nyla Rose choke slammed Chris Flatlander on the apron of the ring and got a two count. Then Nyla Rose puts Statlander on the top rope, you know, across the top rope and she's going up to the top of that big knee that it looks like she kills people with, right? But when she gets up to the top, Nyla Rose, that is, to jump off with the knee onto the back of the head of Statlander, the alien from Andromeda starts walking on her fucking hands to uh, get away from the move. She doesn't stand up off the rope or roll into the ring and jump up to her feet to protect herself. She just starts doing a handstand and walking across the ring because you, she can do that. So since it's something that she can do, what difference does it make that it doesn't make any goddamn sense in this particular wrestling match? Just do it. So she walks to the middle of the ring on her hands and Nyla Rose jumps off the top rope and just comes and spears her while she's upside down and almost drove her head first into the mat. If she hadn't have tucked her head at the last second, it would have been head first like a spike. Blech. I fast forwarded this. I have no idea what happened. Did I miss anything? No. Uh, Statlander won. Oh, well, <laughs> thanks for coming, Nyla. Boy, you know, I wish I could get one of these legendary veterans to be a manager for me so that I could then lose every match I have from then on out. Well, what legendary veteran manager? Vicky Guerrero? Vicky Guerrero. Legendary? Hey, look at this crew. Even Vicky Guerrero's been in the shower more than they've been in the ring. Who came uh, up with that stupid spot? You will just yell at Orange Cassidy and he will sell his ears for the rest of the match. Stupid. Pick it. Pick who. Anybody could have done that because they all think the same way. Um, the Hardly Boys were up next backstage with Brandon Cutlet, and they're trying to shoot baskets. But here comes Dino Douche and Jungle Boy, and Dino Douche blocks one of their shots, knocks one of the Hardly Boys on his ass, and then makes a shot, and then they walk off. So now they're doing comedy skits to promote a joke match for TV next week. So it's good to see that they're really buckling down and trying to improve the ratings. 
Um, they did a package on Red Velvet. She's back by unpopular demand. I like her. Well, out of all the women there, she's the one who always works hard, gets fired up, does an okay promo. I like Red Velvet. Well, now that she's a heel, you shouldn't. Well, I think she was only a heel for these two episodes. We'll see. <laughs> we'll get to that. But what the fuck is that? Oh, Jesus Christ. So Tony Schiavone's in the ring. Is he coloring his hair now? Didn't he used to have some gray? Whoever told him he should put diamond earrings in his ear I know it, it deserves I, to be beaten with a stick. I'm trying to reconcile Tony Schiavone wearing earrings to begin with. But... Tony, you're the same age I am. You were gray on TV. I know I've seen it. So what the fuck? Just live with it. Everybody knows how old you are. Good heavens. Anyway, he introduced Dr. Britt Baker, who got the pop of the fucking night because it's her hometown. They're in Pittsburgh. She's the most over person on the show. She looks great. She had great gear. I was disappointed Reba wasn't with her on this one. Uh, but they were plugging Friday versus Red Velvet. So they put a baby face against Britt Baker in her hometown. She's had matches against heels everywhere else when it was just taking heat off of Britt Baker because she was supposed to be a heel. But now that the people have realized that of all these fucking amateur hour nitwits, she's actually one of the bright spots and they've started cheering her. They don't put her against the heel. They put her against the baby face. Amazing job by Tony here. I got to give him a lot of credit. Taking the Bret Hart baby facing Canada heel in America thing and applying it to Britt Baker in Pittsburgh. Fantastic job. Yeah. So this was the best promo that I've heard on this show in a while. But then Red Velvet hits the ring and instantly the people are booing the shit out of her. She switches heel because she attacks Britt Baker from behind. She's a fucking baby face. She was... The, the partner, the designated Brandy surrogate of Cody against Shaquille O'Neal. She's supposed to be this fucking likable girl, but she jumps the heel champion from behind in the heel champion's hometown, kicks the shit out of her. And by the way, the referees are there instantly. Remember, we've talked about this. Sometimes they come out, especially when it's girls fighting or somebody has uttered a bad word. But when somebody's got a goddamn extension rod shoving it up somebody's ass until it comes out their fucking throat and taking a chainsaw to them ah shit we can't go out there nothing to see there anyway the referees pulled them apart and actually pulled them apart and they stopped fighting and they stood there looking at each other with mean looks on their faces to go to the break when is the last time you saw a pull apart actually be successful it's been a while. I can't think of the last. I can't think of the last time we saw people run out there to pull people apart. So the first successful pull apart in wrestling history happened on live TV. <clears throat> Next in this parade of terror for the Impact Tag Team Title, not even the AEW Tag Team Title, but the title from another promotion that nobody fucking watches, that they are. Some they've somehow been talked into promoting on this television program, Pizzeria Uno and his partner Dick Grayson against Gallows and Anderson, and they stuck Brandon Cutlet in Gallows and Anderson's corner. And the Good Brothers, and they have horrible entrance music, by the way, but the the baby faces again jump started this with a dive over the top rope. I would not book or watch the Super Smash Brothers in 2011, and I'm not going to be watching this 10 years later. Old Fat Uno ought to be called Trio. He's especially embarrassing. And seriously? So did I miss anything here? Because I'm waiting for a goddamn legitimate fucking match that deserves to be on national television. No, you didn't miss anything. I will say, though, out of the two tag teams, I'd rather watch the Dark Order than the Good Brothers any day of the week. Well, I'd rather have my left testicle shatter into seven pieces instead of my right one. Uh, they did a package on Camille and Layla Hirsch again. Whew, boy. And here you got... I know... Uh, Billy Corgan was 
enamored. I'm not talking about like harassing or something, but he liked Camille as a talent. And they also, they had found some other girl with fucking large upper frontal protuberances that they were going to push. And it's when we parted company, I don't know what happened after that, the pandemic, but my God, is Camille reading a teleprompter or is she memorized it? And she's so intent on saying it correctly that she doesn't blink or change inflection in her voice or anything. What do you think? It was the first time I've seen her. I've only seen pictures of her. I never actually heard her speak before. Not good. She's in great shape. I'm talking about the speaking. No, I'm just saying she's, I'm, I'm trying to be positive. She's in great shape. Yeah, by the way, you want to put her against someone who looks like they can maybe be able to do something? Forget Layla Hirsch, Jade Cargill. Where's she? <laughs> Where's Jade? The one who looks like a superstar who's as big as Camille. Well, not as big, but tall. Yeah. Where, where's Jade? Well, she's doing a sponsorship at the Four Seasons Landscaping Shop. in, uh, Or that was the Toronto Four Seasons. Because she's that bitch, dot, 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 who gets paid and never does anything on TV. Yes. Maybe Shaq will come back. Anyway, the next segment, thank God we're almost there. We've only got one thing to go after this, but the next segment, I almost skipped Jericho and Wardlow after I saw this. I said, I can't watch this shit anymore. This was probably, this was the worst thing they've ever done because it was needless. It wasn't, it was a poor idea at the start and it was horribly performed and it made their entire organization look like shit. QT Marshall and that Aaron Solo, Solo and Comorato were there, but not a go-go because he's, he's gone. A go-go's gone back to England. They never even mentioned Solo's name at the start. We were just supposed to know, but they're in the ring with Tony Schiavone. And instead of QT apologizing for whatever the fuck, he demands an apology from Tony Schiavone. And then suddenly... Oh, Comorado, the caveman, is outside on the floor and grabs some nebbish from the front row and throws him in the ring, and they turns out it's Tony Schiavone's son who looks 35 years old, has a long, dark beard, is dressed in a nondescript fashion, maybe five foot fucking nine. We've never seen him. We've never heard him mentioned. He just happens to be sitting front row right now, and QT offhand says he's training to be a wrestler? And they beat up Tony Schiavone's almost middle-aged son. He had five kids when we lived in Charlotte in the 80s, so this kid's got to be 35 years old. They beat up the announcer's son in front of the announcer. They hold the announcer, Tony Schiavone, to watch that. No referees, no security comes out. The announcers don't, nobody gets up from the desk. A policeman is not called. They're just beating up the fucking announcer's son that we've never knew existed until this exact second. And who looks like a man that could not could take care of himself against these guys, but how are we getting sympathy? It's not like they're beating up little fucking tiny Tim with a bad leg and he's nine and he's small for his age. It's a fucking guy with a beard. looks like he rode in on a fucking Harley. But suddenly music starts playing and here comes formerly the big show. Now Paul White walking slowly to the ring. Not in any hurry to save this young man. No. And did you hear his music? I actually wasn't listening. I was so disgusted. What was the music? Well, we need something that sounds like that old song we can't use. Oh, my God. So we God. got something similar. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, awful. So anyway, when he gets to the ring, Tony Schiavone is still in the ring on his knees, comforting his son three feet away from the heels that were just beating his son up. His son is sitting on the apron, not selling, just kind of like bewildered, sitting on the apron while he's comforted by his father. And Big Show choke slam solo, and the rest of the heels leave, and it's all over. And by the time that we see that, Tony's son's back on his feet, standing on the apron, leaning on the top rope, like, well, geez, what just went on? Is that what this wrestling business is all about? This was the phoniest, fakest, stupidest 
most illogical. This could never happen in a million years. It wasn't laid out right. It wasn't executed properly. It was it, stupid to do it with a fucking underneath guy like QT and Solo. This is something that the biggest heel in the company might get some heat off of doing, beating up the announcer's son, but not if the announcer's son is a 35-year-old bearded fuck wearing his fucking baseball cap on backwards like a goof. Who was the sympathetic figure in this? Tony Schiavone for standing there instead of running away? Yes. So I didn't want to watch anything else, but Jericho and Wardlow was coming up. So I I wrote this. I'm done with this fucking show. I'm going to skip ahead to see how they bury Wardlow. As I was fast forwarding, I saw the spot where people were talking about it on Twitter this past week where Jericho got power bombed by Wardlow and the impact of the move was such that he had to pull his drawstring of his trunks out and retie it right on camera in front of everybody. And then Jericho got the walls of Jericho. MJF reached in and gouged his eyes. MJF got ejected from ringside, but Jericho, while that was going on, got his bat and hit a phony-looking bat shot where he didn't hit the man with a baseball bat. He took the bat like a stick in both hands and cupped the end of it and tried to make it look like he was hitting Wardlow in the forehead with the end of the bat that was covered by his fucking hand. You can't use a fucking baseball bat like Bullet Bob Armstrong or some of those guys. Don't use a baseball bat. And then after the phony looking bat shot, he hit the Judas effect on Wardlow and actually legitimately, not in a working fashion, stumbled and fell backwards over on top of Warlow, Wardlow and then pinned him one, two, three. But then it couldn't be over. There's an afterbirth. Spears comes out, attacks Jericho. Sammy Guevara saves him. Wardlow gloms Sammy. MJF gets the arm bar on Jericho's bad arm. Jake Hager hits. The heels run. MJF gets the microphone and says next week it'll be MJF versus Jericho. <laughs> Remember the second week was a death match where you have a chance of bleeding out, right? And then you got to hit a move off the top rope. And then you've got to have a match against my bodyguard. And now he has to wrestle MJF, but Jericho can't have entrance music and he can't use his Judas elbow. That's next week. And I will just put the period on this one with my, my boy, my form. What have they done to my boy? MJF two years ago was the freshest, best, most convincing heel, incredible orator, great promo. They've been booking him for two years, and in between the fucking song and dance routines and the dinner theater and the bad comedy and getting his head flushed in a toilet for real, and ever that he is totally unbelievable as a threat. He never succeeds. His men never succeed. He never wins anything. His group is foolish and feckless and second-rate. And the only part of the group that can really produce in the ring on a regular basis is FTR. And they were buried by the fucking Harley boys before they even got started and now are in the federal witness protection program, whether injured or not, because let's face it, you know that the young bucks can't let a tag team that blows them away every time they appear get any significant time on this television show because it will expose the myth that the young bucks know what they're doing when people see a real tag team. So FTR have had like, what was it? Five or six matches on TV all year. And the young bucks are doing 30 to 40 minute matches yes. on these shows, starting out the show, killing the crowd for some of the other matches. But well, but, but, but besides that, go back to the whole start. The The whole start was, People are saying FTR is the best tag team in the world. Some people say the Young Bucks is the best tag team in the world. Let's get them both in the same place at the same time and have this epic rivalry to settle the score. And they bring them in and they get somebody else to pay for them so that they can fucking beat them in the first match and they never touch again. That's the way you eliminate and bury and basically demean and diminish 
your rivals, when you're an insecure bunch of fucking twats that have, for whatever reason, accepted the viewpoint of a small group of people that you're the best at what you do when what you do is a joke to begin with, you don't want anybody out there doing the shit for real better than you to prove anybody else's point. So you buy them and you bury them. What Ronan Farrow wrote a fucking book about it, Catch and Kill. Pay for them, bury it. That's what they've done with FTR. I'm sincerely hoping that when Cash feels better, that he and Dax can have as few matches for as most money as possible out of this fucking company and then go hide in North Carolina in the woods somewhere because their wrestling fucking careers are coming to an end. They're never going to be seen again. Anyway, closing thoughts on that program. Let's move ahead to Rampage. I will say, no closing thoughts. I covered most of my thoughts. I enjoyed Rampage a whole lot more than AEW Dynamite. You've never been a booker, have you? No. Only for my G.I. Joe Wrestling Federation, which that's you know drew 100,000 people to yeah, Long Beach, New York. That's why you enjoyed it. 